Hello and welcome to chapter 11 IPv6 addressing. So um, in this chapter we are going to cover everything that you need to know about IPv6 and we are not going to go over the slides just like we did in chapter 10. So we're going to go over it in notes. I'm going to be writing some stuff maybe later on but I do want you to write everything that you see on the screen to submit as homework. So this may take a few videos, but by the end of all the videos for Chapter 11, you should know and be comfortable with in dealing with everything that you need to know about IPv6. Okay, so it's also another important chapter this semester. Okay, so let's get started. Um, don't forget to take the notes, all right? All right, so um, in the late 1980s, early 1970s, the booming of the internet going public was, you know, say it was all over the place. So everybody wanted IP addresses to be able to communicate. Um, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Case Task Force, we recognized that there's going to be a problem and we're running out of IP addresses like crazy. I remember in 1995, AOL was able to get, um, had like 30 million users in one year. It was growing exponentially. So the IETF got together and they said, we got to work on um, a new addressing scheme because IPv4 had only 32 bits and they gave us about 4.3 billion addresses. And as you see from the previous chapter, not all the addresses were used. Class D and E were not used to communicate, only classes A, B and C, and then we were, then we started subnetting, um, and then subnetting a subnet using VLSM, and really what saved us, and you know kept the IPv4 around for a while, is the NAT in the early 1990s. But anyway, NAT has its own inherited problem, which is the delay, and NAT for uh, real-time communications could be an issue such as voice over IP and streaming videos. So anyway, they got their heads together and they started working on a new addressing scheme that would give us a much larger, a much more availability, uh, available um, IP addresses. Well, if you hear, you have the five, the regional internet uh, registries, for the five inter regional RIRs in the world. Here are five of them and all of them, as you can see, they have exhausted all their IPv4 addresses. The only one is the African, um, and they're expected to exhaust their addresses sometime this year. All right, so what are the benefits of IPv6? Let's go over those. So this is important. So if somebody ever asks you, why should we go to IPv6 instead of IPv4? So when they started in the early 1990s, got together in the, the IETF groups and they um, wanted to work on a much bigger or better I, IPv6 address. And then they realized, you know, IPv4 also had other problems, other issues that, um, that might, uh, we might solve all together at once. So they got another group working on it, the V6. The V5 were, version 5 were working on the um the ip address itself and the six people were working on all the other issues that ipv4 together in 1998 ipv6 was ratified and so they combined the ipv5 people with the ipv6 so we skipped like a version but it really the five was really never there but anyway so ipv6 was ratified in 19 98 and it fixed all the issues that IPv4 had. Not only that we have the largest number, we have 128 bits now, but now we have, there's no need for subnetting. So all that subnetting that we did on the last chapter in IPv4, we really don't need it because we already have an area, a hex that, that already has us uh, for subnetting. We don't need to subnet. You know, we can create six, over 65,000 subnets. It's already there for us. Number two, there are less labels on the packet. And if there are less labels on the packet, then routers will be able to move 
uh, packets much quicker, better quality of service. We can decide uh, which packet can go first in, there, in case there's traffic. So real-time communication such as voice over IP or um, streaming videos would much rather use and much better controlled with IPv6. Uh, and that's because we don't even need, you know, and because there's no delay, everybody will, oh, I'm sorry. Number four, IP security. IP security is already included in there. So your data is always set up like a VPN with those, uh, with IPv6. So you don't have to worry about having an IP security to authenticate or encrypt your data. It's inherently with IPv6. No need for NAT because <clears throat> you will have a global IP address that you can communicate from inside your LAN out in a secured manner. So you don't have to wait at your gateway to be translated from private to public and vice versa as NAT. And that creates the delay. DHCP is not needed, as we will learn later on. You can retrieve your IP address directly from your default gateway and generate your own IP. You know, get the get enough information from your um, your router, at least the network portion of the IP, and you can generate your own host portion. And no need for a DHCP server, although you can have one if you wanted to. No broadcasting is necessary. You know, in um, in IPv4 we had unicast, multicast and broadcast, but now we only have unicast and multicast. You know, multicasting is sending a packet to several users in the LAN. Well, we could do the same thing by sending, do multicasting, but it's sending it, the group of people is everybody in the LAN, so we can pretend using that. So there's no need for another type of addressing broadcast. Um, any device can have multiple IP addresses. In IPv4, we only had one IP address can be given to a NIC, but now a NIC can have multiple IP addresses. This is something that you got to be careful of. In IPv4, if you typed an address and it was wrong, and if you typed another address, it'll overwrite the other one because we know you can only have one address on that interface. If you did that in IPv6, you typed an IP address wrong on an interface, and then you typed the correct one, the, the, the wrong one will stay there. So you have to remove it before you put, put in the new one. All right, and finally, device configuration. As we will see later on, maybe not this semester, the following and the, and the semester after that, when we are doing configurations for, uh, let's say, routing protocols, much, much simpler than doing it for um, IPv4. All right, so if someone asks you, what are the benefits of IPv6? Well, there they are. The only thing that's not up there is, the, of course, the, a large number of IP addresses, 128 bits. All right, don't forget that. All right, let's take a look at the format. Here is the format of the IP address. It's 128 bits written in hexadecimal numbers, okay? And each portion, so this portion right here is called the hextet because it's 16 bits. Each one of those digits is four. So four times four is 16. This is a 16 bits. And there's um, eight of them. So 16 times eight, um, that's 128. They are separate, separated by colon instead of a dot, okay? This is called the, the GUA, the Global Unicast Address. Global means public. You get on the internet with it. All right, so I highlighted them in red. So the first 48 bits is called the global routing prefix, which we'll just, and this is, we're gonna break it down into a little bit more. Here's, uh, we'll discuss this. Um, the middle part is your subnet. So you have 16 bits already in there for you to create your subnets. That's why no subnetting is needed. So you can, once you get this address right here, you get from your ISP, and then you can create your subnets here. One, two, you can up, you can have close to 65,000 because you got 16 bits. Two to the 16, well, two to the 16, yeah, it's 65,500 something, right? 
And here, the last 64 bits is where you create, you generate your interface, your, um, your host. All right, so you got the local routing prefix, the first 48 bits. And then the next 16 bits is your subnet. And the last part is called the interface ID. All right, so let's break down the global routing prefix. The first 12 bits, that tells you where a regional internet registry is, part of the world, right? So for us in North America, there's a number that indicates we are in the ARIN, right? Um, the next, from 32 to 32 bits, that tells us who your ISP is. And then from 33 to 48 bits, that tells us the site. So the global, uh, I'm sorry, the, the GRP, the global routing prefix, uh, those four, first 48 bit numbers indicates who you are, the, uh, the, the regional internet registry, the ISP, and the site that you are in. Okay, from 49 to 64, these bits are your subnet, and the host bits are at the end. All right, so please write those down. Now, the IPv6 is a 128-bit number. Okay, here's a sample of it. Okay, and so let's go over this sample. The address is made up of 32 hexa, blah, blah. We call them summa quadrats. They're separated by colon. Um, so each quad like is represented by a hexadecimal number. It could be from zero to FFF, right? Um, so how do we write a hexadecimal number? Sometimes if this number is very, very huge, you don't want to write always, you know, you want to write it in a concise form. So we are going to be discussing on how to write it in a concise form. So the first thing you are going to do is the leading zeros can be omitted in each section. So for example, if you have a zero, you don't have to write the insignificant zero. All right? So it could be represented by two. You can write 283 in a quadrant. So here for an example, if you have um, if you have an address like this, so the first thing you're going to do, this is a Four zeros, four zeros, four zeros, right? So you can eliminate three of the zeros, and it could be written FC0, zero, 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 zero. By the way, this zero cannot, you cannot get rid, get rid of because that's significant, okay? So the three zeros can be placed with empty, um, empty colons, okay? So here's a good example. Let's say here is... Here is an example of how to write an IP address. I'm sorry. Here's an example of an IP address. Remember, these are going to be all zero. This is supposed to be having four zeros, four zeros, four zeros. And you have four zeros here, four zeros here. Okay? And the way you will write it, when you have the most number of zeros next to each other, you put the empty column. But you got to keep the other two zeros. Okay? I'm going to stop right here, and uh, please write this down, and when we come back on the next video, I'm going to go over this again, and I'm going to give you examples on how to rewrite, and the rules on how to rewrite an IPv6 address in a concise form. Okay, so just write these down for now, up to here, and submit that as homework, and we'll continue on the next video.